welcome everybody. This is What's Up For Your Children and it's July 6th, 2021. So um, let's check in here and let's just see where the energy is and you know how we wanna engage in the heart um, from that energy field. So let's just see here. Yeah, okay, so let's let's go ahead and start breathing into the heart space and we'll exhale out 360 degrees. And again, when you breathe in from around you, breathe in all the aspects of you. You don't have to leave anything out. It's all part of the whole. So even the parts that we might be pushing against or fighting with at any given moment, invite those in as well. Because the capacity of your own heart space is more than capable of creating a safe space for that energy. Yeah. So again, we're breathing in 300 and, from 360 degrees around us, right into the heart, and then exhaling that back out. And let's do that again, deep, deep, deep into the heart. And exhaling back out 360 degrees. Okay, so one thing I'm just gonna, we're just gonna address here because it's there. It's, it's almost like there's a little, um, you know, we all have protective mechanisms around the heart and rightly so we live on planet earth and you know there's any number of things that can um yeah wound that heart or any number of things that have wounded that heart um but again when we when we believe that 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 the capacity of our own heart is smaller than that which has impacted it then we have a tendency to close our hearts. Yep. And so everywhere where that heart space, you know, really, really wants to open up right now, it really wants to be kind of beyond this or that, right or wrong, good or bad. It just wants to love. Yeah. It just wants to be in that space of love. Let's just go ahead and, and allow that to whatever degree we can. So when you look at that heart space, you know, whatever capacity you see it at, let's just expand that out that much more and kind of go to your edge. Yeah, here we go. And let's just breathe into that space and breathe out to that edge. It's like our hearts are, are and the, the field, not necessarily the heart specifically, but the field of energy that emanates, radiates, broadcasts from that heart. It wants to show us something right now. It wants to show us that we are much more than we perceive ourselves to be. But it's almost like we have a lens on the projector and because that lens is covering up, covering up the projector, it might make the heart feel safer somehow. Um, but that only lasts for a really short period of time because we never feel completely safe. And therefore, the kids around us never feel completely safe unless that field of love is there, right? And so we're just going to take that lens or that cap off the lens and let that field open up just that much more. There we go. Oh, there we go. You can feel it. Your whole body will, you know, you'll, your whole body will either relax or you'll, you'll feel that, that rush of energy that comes into the cells just by giving yourself more heart space. Okay, beautiful. All right, so that's a good place to start. So when you're ready, let's just come on back. 
I'll start here because um, just what I was just talking about reminds me, I had a 20 minute consult yesterday with a new family, just a lovely family, gorgeous kid. And, you know, just, I love seeing these new families all the time come in. And um, the little boy was, when I checked in with him, he was just a love bunny. I mean, I just like, oh, I just love being in his energy. And he just, he kept telling me to tell his parents that he wanted them to hug. He wanted them to kiss. He wanted them to not spend so much focal time on, you know, focal time on him, you know, but really connect with each other. Um, and it was really so cute because the mom said to me, she goes, oh my gosh, he comes over to us all the time and tries to like, push us together, you know, try to, tries to get us to, and I said, well, yeah, take that moment and embrace it because, you know, he's just, he's here as love, you know, and he's trying to show it to you on every single level. So yeah, it's a good place to start with just a good old fashioned hug. So anyway, okay, Sharon, where do you want to go? Well, all right, first question. My almost 20 year old daughter has had a scheduled interview in one place and a scheduled job training at another. And both times she could not get herself to go through with it and did not show up when expected. She's trying to get her first job, wants to move to, wants to live in another part of the country and live on her own, but getting a job is a big hurdle. And the mom is wanting to know how she can assist this daughter in getting her her uh, a job but at the same time wants the uh, wants to honor the agency of the daughter being afraid and getting through the hurdle well and I think you just answered your own question because <clears throat> it's not about the job right it's not about the interview it's about whatever that that experience um, brings to the surface for her you know whether that's you know being responsible for herself or having to be responsible for herself or moving out into the world. There feels like there's a, <clears throat> I keep hearing responsibility, you know, as <clears throat> part of it, sorry. Um, I keep hearing responsibility as part of it. So, um, you know, again, if we can consider that the outer experiences in our life are only there to bring up certain things, right? So relationships, job interviews, you know, the things that we engage in on a daily basis are really just teaching us one of two things. They're teaching us, you know, or showing us what has yet to be integrated or what has been integrated, you know? So, so I would speak to her specifically about what she knows about the feelings that she's having um, around it. Um, I would spend more, much more time there than on the actual outcome of the interview because she'll get to the interview place once she really understands that she can feel safe within herself around these feelings that she's having. And she just needs a, she just needs a, a sounding board more than anything. She's more than capable, you know, she just needs the sounding board. So, yeah. Hope that's helpful. Okay, this question is, the agency who runs my daughter's uh, group home is trying to get me removed as her substantial decision maker and have the public trustee take over. I feel it is because she is not vaccinated. The question is, uh, let's see, uh, is, the safe, is the group home safe for her and is the and does the director of the agency know about my freedom fighter work and wants me out, but this is her daughter's home and she loves the staff and the roommate there. Hold on a second. I want to, <clears throat> I want to address this a little bit differently than the way that you asked it. Um, because I want there to be more, I want there to be more power, empowerment for you in this in this question on the one hand you know your your daughter is you're saying she's enjoying the 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 group home that she's in and she's enjoying those friends and 
there's that part of it. And on the other hand, you have somebody asking um, to be able to make decisions for her that might go against the decisions that you would like to make for her or that you feel are in her highest and best interest. And I wanna put the power right back into for you because quite honestly, um, I mean, how would you feel if somebody made a decision for her that was totally against what you felt was was good for her, you know? And I just, it's not the same thing, but I will say it reminds me of, um, it reminds me of my, my youngest daughter was not vaccinated at all since, since she was two, I found, found out about vaccines and started doing my research, you know, after Riley. And so she was only two at the time. So I stopped vaccinating her. And later in life, um, she was, I don't know, probably, I don't know, she was probably 12 or something like that at that point. And she said, mom, I really want to get vaccinated. I was like, you do. And she said, she said, yes. Yeah. So I said, why is that? And she said, well, because all my friends are. And all my friends are getting vaccinated. And I said, well, we don't make choices about our bodies because of our friends. We don't make choices of, about our bodies because we like the environments that we're in or because, and so I just wanna, I just wanna offer that back because it's tricky right now. We're having to make really hard decisions. Um, and, and even your question, you know, do they know about your stance around vaccines or your stance about your choices for your own health? I mean, even that kind of indicates that, you know, you're, you're kind of butting heads or you're perceiving that you could butt heads with this organization that's caring for your child. And it's tricky right now because we're having to make these kinds of decisions all the time. And um, yeah, and I don't wanna take the power of that away from you. I know it's a hard decision to make. Um, yes, she likes it there. I can see that very clearly. Yes, you know, the vast majority of the people are good human beings, you know, they're good, decent people that are caring for her. And at the same time, those decent human beings may not have the information that you have, and therefore may not be able to make the decisions for her that you might want to make for her. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, it's, again, it's, where do you want that power to lie? It's um, in your hands or in theirs. Is really the question. So, yeah. Tricky one, I know. It's like they just don't make it easy, you know? It's like they just don't go, okay. Um, but there's something in that too. It's like when it's, when we rub up against those places, we really start to figure out, you know, what is it that we stand for? What, you know, what is it that's true for us? And at the end of the day, that's all we can live from. And you hope that everybody else would live from that as well. You know, whatever their choices are, those are their choices and um, love to honor that. But also at the end of the day, gotta honor our own. Yeah, so thanks, yeah. Okay, next question is, my five-year-old son continue, continuously mounts objects. It, it, let's see, it has increased the past few days and has come to the point where he's biting things way too hard, breaking items, cutting his gums, or gagging himself. His teeth are very sharp and damaged from repetitive hitting his chin and clacking his teeth, which is lessening the past few days. We have tried a replacement objects and tons of different teething and sensory objects to no avail. We know that there's a lot more to do with it than sensory seeking. Any further insights would be appreciated. Yeah, there's, there is a lot more to it than sensory seeking. The, um, he's got a lot, um, he's, well, on the one hand, he's definitely needing that pressure in, um, he's, how do I want to say this? He's using pressure 
to help relieve pressure. So what it looks like is like the plates in his head, you know, are kind of, um, are fused in such a way that he can feel and that is uncomfortable for him. So that's creating a pressure. So instinctually he's going, okay, let's see what kind of pressure, let's see if I can move it this way or move it that way. See if I can jam this up in that way to get that to move. So I definitely look into some kind of cranial sacral work. Um, yes, I, to me, it looks like cranial sacral um, is the primary. Um, yeah, I think that would be the primary mode to help shift that. Um, it also creates like a like an anxiety for him as well. You know, it's like there's definitely an anxiety around that pressure. And so sometimes it can look like a, it's like a little, uh, it can look like a little, not, not full blown like OCD, but it can look like that. You know, it's like, gotta do it, gotta do it. It's like, it's controlling him instead of him controlling it. So um, yeah, some type of osteopathy or um, cranial sacral work, something along those lines could be really helpful. To all the plates. Yeah. It hap I just want to say it happens a lot. Um, you know, they're on the one hand, a lot of the kids being born now, especially those that end up getting diagnosed or having some kind of sensitivity, also have a tendency to have um have big bigger heads than kids had before, right? And so, I mean, and in some ways, uh, there's all kinds of different ramifications around that. And there's all kinds of reasons for that. You know, just the, there's all kinds of information that I won't go into now about that particular thing. But they also have a tendency as they're coming through the birth canal to lock up those cranial plates in ways that, um, that just don't release very quickly. And then you know, they, they, when they come through that birth canal and that's, it's designed to be able to, you know, kind of squeeze that head through that birth canal. But for them, it's like, it's like once it comes back out, they're, it's like, it's almost like it can't come far enough back out to fit the size of their, what their natural head shape is designed to be. And so it gets almost halfway out. And then it fuses, it's already starting to fuse. So we need to, we need to open that space back up to give them that full capacity so they don't feel that pressure. Yeah. Yeah, it creates inflammation too, it hurts. Okay, next question. My son has been struggling with chronic car sickness. I want to support him, but I am unsure what is causing it. For example, anxiety, food allergy, sensitivities, feelings, others, energy, etc. Another emotional issue. Please share. Um, and then just wants any insights. Um, so children that have height, let's say, children who have heightened perceptual abilities also have a tendency to be children who have challenges physically tracking visually. Um, and to me, I, it's, um, I would say it's good old fashioned motion sickness, but it's not motion sickness. Um, there's a reason behind that motion sickness as you ask that question. So, Lots of information coming in. He's trying to track all that information. That 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 challenge of tracking information moves down into the visual um, visual perception. And so, as he's moving or tracking things visually, it's that's challenge that kind of throws him off as well. Um, so. Um, I, I have another question. Um, I, so if you can put it in, I'm just going to ask a question, just a yes, no, you can put it in Sharon's chat. 
Um, does he does he use devices and things like that? Like is he on his is he on something like on his off your phone or a iPad or something like that when he's in the back seat of the car? Yes. Okay, that's that's part of it too. Because again, your um, my grandson actually has this too. But so yeah, lots of information has a little bit of challenge with visual tracking anyway. Then he's got a device that he's trying to visually track. Plus, there's things going by him, you know, um, beside him. And so his peripheral vision is trying to track that. And his frontal vision is trying to track the, the device, right? So, um, so there's, there's just an awful lot going on. So you can start saying to him, one, you know, what happens when he does put down the device? Is it easier? You know, does, you know, um, that could help. The other thing I will say is because sometimes you're on a trip and you want him to be able to have that engagement while you're thinking for a moment, <laughs> you know, in your own mind. Um, Nux Vomica is a homeopathic remedy that seems to work really well. Um, so you can give him that and see if that helps. Um, but ultimately what we really wanna do is we want to teach him, you know, what's going on. We want to explain to him what's going on and so that he can start making choices about how he wants to feel. And sometimes, again, that choice means I gotta put this down for a second and listen to music or do something else that doesn't require so much visual tracking. He's just got information coming in from so many different angles. Yeah. Yeah. But Nox Vomica does help too. I keep that in my car all the time. <laughs> so. My child has always had spells where she wakes up at any time from 12.30 a.m. to 4.30 a.m. and can stay up until the following night. She is full of energy and happy when she wakes up. However, it is exhausting for me since I am not able to fully sleep when she is up. This happens every three or four weeks. And she's here, the mom hears this is common in autism, but she's wondering if there's other things she can do to help her sleep better. Yeah, you know, um, what she's showing me is this is, you know how they talk about, um, I think it's Ayurvedic medicine. They talk about different times that belong to different um, uh, organs and things like that. Um, she hers is actually related to digestion is what it looks like to me and so there's you know and it's interesting that it's you know we've got a longer time period a lot of times people will wake up at two or they wake up at three or whatever but to me it looks like this is more of the body sending a signal um to wake up you know, in order, to, it's almost like the body is sending a signal to wake up in order to digest or as she's trying to digest something that she hasn't been able to digest, her body wakes her up during that process. So um, let's see what she, yeah. Um, How old is she? Can you put it in the chat, please? Eight. Eight, yep. Okay, so definitely um, there, well, all I'll say is that I would explore some balance for the, the gut flora because it's it's off, you know, it's, it's just off and um, Sometimes just getting the right support for the gut will let her, because it is, it's almost like her body starts working hard to digest something in the middle of the night and where most of us would sleep right through that. You know, um, she's waking up because of it. Um, so I just want to see if there's anything else I can tell you.
Yeah, she just wants you, she wants you to explore that gut flora, and she also wants to. Um, she's also asking that if you change the dynamic of like when the when the last thing is that she eats, when she, so she'll have some more time to digest food before she ever goes to bed. It's probably she's probably not one of those kids that you want to give a a, a later snack to. Um, because then she's trying to figure out how to digest that once she goes to sleep and it wakes her back up. So I would play with that. I would play with those gut flora and maybe not, you know, maybe after, yeah, maybe after she eat, she just needs some time between the last meal that she has and when she actually goes to sleep. So my 11 month old son has struggled staying asleep for his, for his whole life. He wakes up crying at least once and sometimes multiple times per night. He has been doing this since he was very young. I thought at first it was just colic or gas. And so I made the necessary, necessary changes. He doesn't to be in any kind of pain during the day and or distress. We have co-slept and he is still breastfeeding. Now he's, he wakes up and is still having and have had all of his needs met I'm, and he just wants to cry and do whatever feelings that he's had she's just wondering is there any other emotional needs or release that she can do to help him feel better um let's do this right now because he actually is um well, he's actually longing for um a how do i say this uh he's he's missing people from another incarnation he's missing people from his past incarnation and so there's there's a you know again as parents we get really you know he's my kid he's you know it's like it's my baby you know and i completely get that i have four girls of my own and I completely get that. And at the same time, I don't see him in any pain. I mean, I don't see that there's something physically going on for him, but I do feel this pull from him, like this longing. And so let's just acknowledge that, you know, he doesn't come here empty. He doesn't come here without other relationships already intact. And so, um, yeah, honestly, even he's 11 months old, you know, you could, I would even say to him, you know, as you're, as you're rocking him or as you're nurturing him, as you're nursing him, you know, it's like, I would, you know, just that it's okay to miss, it's okay to miss people. It's okay to, you know, um, that it's almost like there's, yeah, there's this long, I, it's like I what, watch him pull me back in through utero and back into um, another time. And so let's, um, I just want to see if there's any undone business there too, because usually there's a longing because it's not complete, right? So let's, um, let me just see something here. Yeah, I feel whatever this is, is it's almost like somebody just didn't get to say goodbye. You know, somebody just didn't get to sever that relationship in a way that felt complete. And so um, we're just gonna let him know right now that, you know, he's safe in this new incarnation. He's loved, he's appreciated. Um, and that, and that, and that he can say, he can say goodbye at any moment. He didn't have to say goodbye then. It didn't have to be just because it didn't get done then. I'm just putting this, we're just putting this all into his field. And so if we'll all intend it on his behalf, then maybe he'll get some sleep. So let's see if there's anything else. Yeah, it's just, I miss you. It's, he misses someone. 
and he didn't get to say goodbye. And if that was, if that was a small child that was mourning the loss of uh, another physical human being, you know, that, that was here now, how would we, you know, how would you support a little 11 month old? You know, it's like, it's okay, it's okay. You know, we can, we can say goodbye now. Um, or that person is always with you. Um, you know, maybe you don't have to say goodbye the way you thought you needed to. Yeah, and he's just asking, you know, can I, can I bring her here? You know, whoever she is, can I bring her here? And of course he can, you know, of course he can do that. Um, and it doesn't have to diminish your connection or your relationship with him either. You know, he's just wanting to feel safe um, in that transfer. And because that, and because he didn't get to say goodbye, and now he's in this incarnation, it's almost like he's got one hand pulled this way and, you know, one hand pulled towards you. And so we just want to let him know one way or another that he doesn't have to make that separation until he's ready to make that separation until he totally feels safe. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. All right. Thank you. Okay, this question is, uh, and it's kind of long, let's see. I came across a post from a perspective, perspective of a mother of a child with autism in regards to independence in connection to this weekend's holiday. The post was heartfelt and sincere, but the mother compared her child to the other children playing nearby that were the same age and stated that independence isn't something he will ever have, ever. After that, I wasn't able to continue reading it. If it would have come across this, if I would have come across this post two years ago, maybe I would have felt differently. But all I could think of was that's absolutely no, not true. Shouldn't we flip that and recognize that these children are able to experience a different form of independence, one that provides uh, le less impact from entanglements and conditions and constructions by others? Of course, my motherly brain worries about my child being able to take care of himself when he's grown up. And of course, his interests and behaviors are different than others his age. What further insights or clarity can you provide into this? Yeah, I think this goes hand in hand with the, you know, the blog that I just put out, it, you know, um, at the beginning of the month, you know, like, let's assume that they can because, you know, assume that they can't or assume that they can, well, we're more likely to get that, that back, right? And, um, you know, and I think this applies not just for, you know, kids on the spectrum, it applies really everywhere. It's like, we see people, we see people through the lens of our own beliefs. And so I think, you know, and, you know, this parent is, you know, where this parent is, and that's, you know, that's the reality that's being kind of created from that awareness, right? So it's not a rightness or a wrongness, but from the perspective of the person who's asking this question, you're asking for a broader view, right? A broader view of, um, of what's possible. And we create that broader view of what's possible. I mean, not fully because, you know, your son has his own trajectory, but the fact is, is that, you know, if we, if anybody sees us with the eyes of limitation, we have a tendency to feel limited in their presence and thus give a limited perspective or a, a limited, uh, expression of ourselves back when somebody sees us as capable you know as um expansive as you know creative as yeah we're all challenged you know <laughs> we're, we're all challenged but our how are we perceived within that challenge is that challenge perceived as a weakness or is that challenge perceived as 
um, a opportunity to know oneself and know one's capacity to overcome those challenges. It's, it's all where we put our focus. And so I'm with you. I would, I would really prefer to not restrict, you know, someone standing in front of me, regardless of their diagnosis, and and see what comes back from that. Yeah, because we never really know what's possible until we kind of open it up. That said, it really is important for us to look at what our belief systems are because you know what we project onto somebody else as far as their capacity or lack thereof really has to do with our own belief systems about how capable we feel or don't and so let's just ask the question it's like is that true you know is it true i i mean we don't have to go into some deep psychological you know uh reflection even but just asking a simple question, is it true that this child will not be capable when he's older? You know, is it true that, you know, that he can't tie his shoe or he'll never be able to get to that place? You know, it's like the minute we say, yes, that's true. Yes, that's true. <laughs> yeah. We don't have any idea how powerful we are and what amazing spaces we can create when we just ex expand what might be possible. So I hope that's helpful. Can I ask a question off of that? Please, yeah. <laughs> As being the own, my own mother that I am, I'm pulling, moving myself from the anxiety and the fear that gets stuck in my belly, mm -hmm pulling that back out to create that space just gather all that up i mean i just think as moms in general we all get so worried and then we don't pull ourselves out of it don't make that choice well yeah because i i think what happens is we go to we go to fixing first instead of awareness yeah. you know it's like we're all you know we're all the parents and you know, we've all been conditioned to believe that it's our responsibility to fix the situation on behalf of our children, right? The, the blog also spoke about that. Sally, who's with us today, was in that blog. So she has a really, she had a very specific experience with her son. And, you know, I mean, and most people would say, you know, if they just had a look at her son that, oh, well, he's not going to be able to do that. Or that's, you know, he's, they, they might perceive him as, you know, limited in a particular way. And yet, you know, this kid, she basically just he wanted the lights on. I want the lights on. I want the lights on. The lights have been off. I want the lights on. And she said, you do it, you know, make, make it happen. You know, you're capable. And boom, steps back and the lights go on, right? So, I mean, it's not, again, we're, we don't know. We don't know what somebody else is capable of. And so let's, yeah, so let's step back from, well, I'm not gonna fix it for you. It's, it's not my job to fix it for you. It is my job, however, to, to create as much, energetic space for you to show me something else back yep that's my job and so I would just I would flip it I'd go right into the anxiety in the gut and notice what that actually is ask yourself some questions about where it comes from again it's going to be our own perceived limitations we're feeling like we're not capable as parents and therefore we project onto the kids, they're not capable. And they are, you know, it's like, if you look at it energetically, what's really beautiful is, you know, we've got these little people walking around. Well, we've got big people walking around that, you know, one might perceive as not being uh, quite capable in certain ways. <clears throat> and yet every single person has these 
skill sets, these capacities that never get tapped into because we don't think they can. Yeah, oh, well, they're a little person or they're, a, you know, they're challenged in this way. Okay, yep, that's true. They are in little bodies and they are challenged in these ways. And what else is possible? You know, what else is available? Yeah. Again, let's assume that they can, which was the name of that blog. <laughs> so assume that they can. Does that help, Sharon? Yeah. Okay, cool. My eight-year-old son has just started losing weight, and I'm wondering if another food sensitive, to, sensitive or something else. Previously, he had been thriving on lots of avocado between his pureed meals, as he cannot tolerate solid foods. I'm wondering if he's becoming sensitive to histamine overload like his older brother, or could it be something else? You know, I think that... Um... Fortunately or unfortunately, anytime like something, anytime anything is eaten repeatedly, right, as a support or a substitute, we can build up an allergy to that, right? So it's almost like what all that he is saying to me is that he needs breaks. It's almost like he needs breaks from, so let's say, avocados are being used to support him. He needs a break from it. Like almost like, uh, it's more like how he's fed than what he's fed is what he's saying to me anyway. So it's almost like he needs breaks, uh, three, four days off and then back on again. So his body has a chance to reset. Yeah, and to receive that what he's taking in again. Um, uh, something else, Sharon, ask me the question again, because there's something else here that he's showing me on a different, not a physical level, but I want to make sure I've got it right. Let's see. Let's see. My eight-year-old son has just started losing weight, and I am wondering if it's another food sensitivity or something else. Previously, he had been thriving on lots of avocado between his pureed meals as he can't tolerate solid foods. I'm wondering if he's becoming sensitive to histamine overload like his older brother, or could he have something else? Well, I think, I mean, you said it at the very beginning, so we've got that physical part of it. It's like in, so that on the physical level, he does need breaks from, um, from having the same food over and over again. And it, it doesn't mean that we can't go back to it. It's just that he needs breaks so his body can readjust. Um, and then that said, there's there's another piece. He It's so interesting because he's, I'm not sure if he wants to deal with it quite yet or not. Um, it's, hold on a second. He shows it to me and then he takes it away and then he shows it to me and he takes it away. So um, let's, let's, here's your, here's your opportunity. Bring it to the forefront if you want us to discuss it here. Okay. He's talking about this sense of He's not talking about it as digestion. He's talking about it as like a transmutation. It's like it's, you know, like on a physical level, you know, can we digest certain experiences in our life? Um, he's talking about trying to move something through him that he's trying to transmute. And I'm sorry, I'm going to be. You can ask more questions about this if we, you know, if uh, we can, um, because all I it's it, all I can say is what he's giving me at this moment, which is he's trying to transmute something through his energy field. Um, in other ways, I would say I would have said before he's trying to digest something, but he, it's not just a matter of digesting a past experience, he's trying to transmute it 
And for whatever reason, he feels like it's a transgression is the word I'm hearing, but a transgression on his part, nothing bad, nothing terrible, nothing, anything like that. But he's trying to transmute it um, through his own body and he's trying to shed it energetically. Um, so let's just do this. So whatever that, whatever he perceives that transgression was, it's again, it's nothing horrible or anything like that. It's the way he feels it in his own body and the way he's trying to transmute that transgression um, is, okay, is challenging for him right now. And so it's also why his body is saying, okay, I can't digest this and digest this or transmute this at the same time. Um, so the physical body has its patterns and he needs those patterns in the physical body to be shifted a little bit so that he can work energetically on the deeper part of this. So everywhere and anywhere where there is this sense for him that there's some transgression that he's trying to transmute, we just, we don't want him to feel in any way um, we, in judgment of himself. We don't want him to feel, uh, he doesn't need to feel in judgment of himself. Um, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, <laughs> um, there's a song running through my head that my kids used to listen to when they were little, which is, I made a mistake, but that doesn't make me bad. <laughs> Yeah, it's like I made a mistake, but that doesn't make me bad. Um, and so, and that's so we're just we're just moving that from that energetic field. We're just clearing that out, and we can all intend that that move in that way. The mom just tech, um, post, posted. Uh, she stopped the avocado for now and moved to bananas, but she is work. He is so t small that she's already worried about it, but she's wondering if the transgression is his older three siblings lost their father last month. And could this be relevant to what he's feeling? Um, so the older, uh, this is a little bit more than probably for this setting, but the, but the older three children, that's not his father, that's their father. Is that right? He's, he has a, he has a different yeah. father than, okay. Yeah, that, yes, that, that could definitely be part of it. Um, there, he, it does, it's, it's this, what I'm just seeing is this feeling of his, within him of a perceived transgression. I mean, we could, it's, it's a little deeper than what I can go into right now, but, but yeah, it, it could definitely be associated, but again, it's, it's like this thing where, you know, a kid has a thought and it's, you know, it's kind of a benign thought, but he makes it a wrongness within him, right? And as he makes it a wrongness within him, he tries to transmute that wrongness, but that's what I'm saying. It's like, it's not, wasn't wrong to have that feeling or wrong to have that, that idea in the first place. You know, he's just, he's a, he, not just a kid, but he's, you know, an individual, a small person, a small child having this, uh, this feeling, it's not wrong. Um, it's just, he made it wrong. And as he makes it wrong, it becomes challenging to digest it. And he'll, he'll move through the cycle. But I would, I would literally just talk to him about, um, about how he feels about all of it. You know, I'd like to just give him a voice if he can speak to you about it. Um, and if not, um, I would just maybe, hmm, I don't know, there, there's just some conversation that can be had, some awareness that can be had around how they feel and how he feels because they feel away because of a particular situation, but he feels away too. He just doesn't have that situation to peg it on. Yeah. So there's something, um, there's something right there. And I, 
I think that's why he was kind of holding back. He's not given me the full picture quite yet. I think he feels, I think he had a thought and he feels bad about the thought. And um, yeah, he sees it as a transgression and it's not a transgression, it's just a thought, <laughs> so. Sorry, I wish I could give you more on that, but. All right, that's it on questions. Okay, all right. Um, all right, we're just about at an hour or two, so probably won't ask for more. So let me see if there's anything else that wants to be shared today. I think if we, I think if we make this really practical in these moments, and again, regardless of what's being experienced in the physical world, you know, with our kids, we have a tendency to say, oh, it's, you know, try to figure it out, you know, here mentally, you know, and we try to figure it out from our conditioning, basically. And so let's just, let's, a, let's ask questions. You know, what's in this beyond what I'm seeing? Yeah, what's possible beyond what I'm seeing um, or noticing? You know, let, let's just, let's, let's get that beyond perspective in there somehow. And, and I'd really encourage you too, that when you ask a question like that, when you notice that, you know, your kids having whatever behavior that they're having. The minute that you notice it, um, first, how does it make you feel? You know, what, what's, what's it bringing up for you? So let's have that awareness first. And then let's just go into, okay, I know what my part of it is. I know what, how I'm feeling in it. And then just open that up. You know, I wonder how he or she's feeling in it. I wonder, you know, because so we don't just project what we're feeling onto them, but we know how we're feeling about it. We know what it's bringing up for us. And then the curiosity is, I wonder what this is for them, yeah? And when we open it up like that, very often that answer is not gonna come immediately. It's not gonna, you know, you're not gonna hear a voice in your head that says it's this, you know, maybe, um, but, but, what, what we're really doing is we're opening up a bigger field. We're opening up a bigger field of consideration. I know how it feels for me and my body. I wonder how it is for them. And maybe even, you know, show me. Show me how it is for them so that I can actually meet that need, you know, meet that experience instead of just project onto that experience. Yeah. Yeah, it's, you'll, I promise it'll, it's going to open, 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 open. If you get in the habit of that, you're going to start having levels of awareness of what's going on that's just far beyond what you've been perceiving up to this point. Yeah. So, yeah, cool. All right. Um, all right. Let me see if there's anything else. And then. You know, it's, it's just such a beautiful time to explore. And I know they're very challenging times. I'm not going to say that it's easy to just step out of, you know, the, the uh, hamster wheel that we can kind of get ourselves in, right? But it's, but I will say that you really do have all of evolution on your side at the same time that you're making those little step backs because I mean so much is shifting so much is changing so much more is available in consciousness that was ever available before and so sometimes those little micro movements that we make where we we don't jump into thinking it's this you know we kind of step back and kind of go oh, I don't know what it is you know, I don't, don't know what it is. Let's open up that field and, and have, some, have that awareness come back to us. I think you'll be surprised at just how those little micro movements 
start creating a reality of addressing things energetically instead of what the mind thinks is the reality because it's not. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. So I hope that's helpful, everybody. Thanks for the great questions and uh, lots of love. I'll see you next time. Bye.